let's get started with today. Uh, we've got a fun one today. Uh, at least for me, it's fun. We are moving to the new world a little bit. Uh, we are covering Argentina and USA today. So you might be surprised that I'm not continuing with the old world with maybe the Italians or the Spanish or something like this. Uh, but I felt like after France, it's a good idea to uh, just briefly visit the new world um, to see how um, how things started off there. So just to do a brief recap of last week. Uh, so we were talking about Bordeaux predominantly. And then uh, in the last session, we were talking about some of the other regions as well. Uh, Rhone Valley was a, was an interesting one. Loire Valley, of course, as well. We talked about Didier Dagano, which was this beautiful... Uh, winemaker that uh, revolutionized the way they did uh, wines in Loire Valley. Um, we talked about all of the other tiny regions as well. Um, we pointed out Vangeon. Does anybody remember what Vangeon is? Anyone? So Vangeon is this. Is when uh, um, you, when the, the wine evaporates eh, and then they don't top up the one in the barrel, if I'm not mistaken. Aging on the leaves. Mm, kind of in between what you two said, yeah. So, because the wine always evaporates in a barrel and in other countries or in other regions, they will top it up, so it, it evaporates slower. In Banjong, they let it. Uh, and what this does is that there's a yeast crust uh, that forms on top of the wine, and this influences the wine with kind of nutty flavors. Um, the wine is aged for a minimum of six years and three months, if I'm not wrong. Um, and then it's it's released and it's yellow in color. It's quite interesting, really full of flavor, but yeah, definitely a delicacy, definitely not something um, to be taken lightly or just kind of bought by mistake. Okie doke. So let's start with today. So I wanna start off with USA. So, and again, to start off with USA, um, we need to kind of understand the history of it first. So the first people that properly discovered, so we know that Columbus was the first one to land in America, but the first people that uh, kind of uh, researched the, what is today USA were the Vikings. Um, and the Vikings actually named it um, something like Vin, Vin Town, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and the reason for that was because they saw that there were vines all over uh, the territory. Uh, we are not talking about vines like in uh, European vineyards, but these were proper wild vines. So we mentioned in one of the previous sessions that we have different types of vitis um, species uh, of, of the vines. So America is famous for having a lot of them. So one of the most famous one is Vitis Lambrusca that we talked about being as one of the most important rootstocks um, used these days. So the Vikings were the first people. Um, there was a lot of obviously these native grape varieties uh, that were grown all over the all over the place. So they didn't really know what Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay were at that time. And this was in the 1550s. So not that long ago, if you look at it. Uh, but then the missionaries came, same as everywhere else. Um, and obviously they were kind of the main reason for proper cultivating of uh, vineyards. So these were mainly Spanish missionaries that they settled in uh, in the south, sort of south and southwest. Um, so it was New Mexico, it was Nevada, it was uh, California. So mainly in New Mexico and Nevada where, where the first vineyards were, let's say commercial, but even though they weren't really commercial because they were for the missionaries. Um, so that's where the first vineyards kind of started off. Uh, what that meant is because they were Spanish uh, missionaries, there was a lot of Spanish grape varieties. Uh, and one of the main grape varieties was the Mission grape, which is not Spanish, but it was actually brought from Chile uh, to the north. So Chile was, uh, was actually quite successful at that time uh, because um, it was one of the first because when they were traveling around the globe, Chile was the, 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 the side of the Americas that they landed on, right? So on one side was Chile, on the other side was kind of Central America and, 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 and Colombia, not Colombia and uh, Brazil and so on. So Chile was on the other side. So, um, so the mission grape is thought to be kind of one of the, the main grapes of the Americas, you know. Uh, in Chile, they actually call it país. It's actually not a great grape. 
you can find some incredible examples, but they're very, very, very rare. Most of the time, it was just kind of like the sacrilegious uh, grape variety. Anyway, so this, this was constantly happening. So they had these Spanish grape varieties. They produced a lot of wine, mainly for their own consumption uh, and for, for religious purposes. And then the Americans, uh, they like to do, they, they kind of shot themselves in the foot and they had this thing called the prohibition in the 1920s. So what is prohibition? So prohibition, basically Americans said, everything is going out of control. Uh, people are getting too drunk. Uh, we need to stop this. So they, they stopped production of alcohol uh, across the country. Uh, this sparked a lot of, uh, obviously, the black market and mafia, uh, namely, you know, Mr. Al Capone. You've heard of him. He was famous for bringing in whiskey uh, from Canada and so forth. Um, but what this meant in terms of wine is obviously that there was uh, wine plantings have stopped. Uh, a lot of people have pulled out their vineyards. There were still a lot of some people that were growing uh, wine uh, or sorry, uh, grapes, um, some for actual grape consumption. But there were also some people that were allowed to produce tiny little quantities, um, mainly for religious purposes. Now, this lasted for quite a while, but then they finally kind of uh, got out of the pro prohibition and then the Second World War started. So again, there was not much, much reason to uh, kickstart the American wine industry. So even though the Americans have been making wine for 500 years, they, were, they, they really kicked off in the 1960s. Uh, and this happened with a, a guy called Robert Mondavi. So Robert Mondavi is this really quirky, um, guy, very confident, very, uh, uh, how would I say, um, he, he, said, uh, he had a lot of character, let's put it that way. And he believed he had a very, very good vision for uh, Napa Valley. So Napa Valley, uh, which we'll talk about later, is one of the regions in uh, kind of Northern California. And Robert Manavi believed that, that Napa produced some of the most amazing wines in the world. It was relatively well off. Um, so he got to travel the world a lot, and he always uh, had a bottle of um, some sort of a Napa wine with him. Um, and he always compared it with other people. He went to France, and he drank a Bordeaux and, and tried it with a, a Napa Valley wine. He was just kind of trying to see where they are in terms of quality. Um, he was also famous for building the first uh, new winery since the Prohibition. Um, and yeah, that kind of kick-started the whole of production of Napa, of taking themselves seriously a little bit more. Now, <clears throat> they were still not proper um, prestigious farmers, let's say. These were guys that were surfers, these were guys that were hippies, they were stoned a lot. Um, these were guys that were unhappy bankers in San Francisco and they, they, they had money and they just decided to move up. Uh, north and build a vineyard and have a ranch or whatever. Um, so they weren't really still taking uh, themselves that seriously. They believed in it, they believed in terror, they believed that they can produce stuff. Um, but yeah, they, they, nobody knew about it. And then there was this guy called Stephen Spurrier. He's an English guy. If you ever go to London Wine Fair, you'll definitely meet him. He's still around. Sorry? No. Guys, just mute him. Um, so this guy, Stephen Spurrier, he had a little, uh, he was English and he had a little uh, uh, wine shop, wine academy sort of thing in Paris in France. Obviously he loved wine, so he went there. And uh, he was famous for not only having French wines, but having a, a, a selection of wines from Italy as well, Spain, and a little bit from uh, New World countries. But nobody drank those wines at that time because France was the only, uh, only country that mattered in the world of wine. So he got pissed off and he said, okay, let me change this up. So he went to California and he said, I'm gonna choose the best wines from California. I'm gonna bring them over to France. We're gonna do a blind tasting. Uh, with some of the top uh, French wines and we'll see where we stand. So his idea was basically just to show that they can be kind of uh, decent wines, that they're not as bad as people thought. So he did this, he went to California, visited hundreds of wineries, um, brought them over to France, to Paris. They did a blind tasting and in the blind tasting, he only invited uh, French people. So it was 
You remember when we were talking about Burgundy, we were talking about Domaine de la Ramonne Conti and Aubert de Vilaine. So Aubert de Vilaine was one of the, the, the judges in this blind tasting. Um, it was the direction uh, director of the uh, INAO, so the Inter Institut National de Pollution d'Origine. So a lot of basically very, very famous people. Uh, I think it was the winemaker of Lafitte uh, there as well. So they tasted these wines blind. Um, and the result was that in the end, American wines won. So in white wines, a Chateau Montelena from the north of Napa Valley uh, kicked ass all of, all of the Burgundies uh, and a winery called Stag's Leap Winery from kind of the southern part of Napa uh, kicked ass uh, of all of the Bordeaux. And these were not just basic Bordeaux, these were, you know, Lafitte's uh, were there. Uh, so some serious wine. What this meant was that suddenly everybody was like, whoa, 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 what do you mean American wines beat the French wines? That's impossible. That can't happen. Um, but it did. And this uh, kind of brought America to the fore and they started to become this uh, nation to be taken seriously. Now, not only did, did the Americans start taking themselves seriously, like I said, uh, they started uh, buying more and more vineyards. Um, so basically since then, um, it is pretty much all of Napa was populated with, with vineyards. Everybody, everybody that had a little bit of money went there. Um, but yeah, so this is where we are today. Americans started taking themselves seriously and now they are probably one of the, in terms of premium wines, they are the new world uh, nation when we talk about it. Okay, so in terms of wine region, so I've talked about Napa quite a bit. Uh, so basically we're talking about California. So California is the region in the western part next to the Pacific Ocean. If you remember when we talked about uh, when we talked about um, Coriolis effect, remember the Coriolis effect? So that was that uh, the 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 way the water travels um, in the northern and the southern hemisphere. So because of that Coriolis effect, we know that when when it comes down to the um, when the Pacific Ocean reaches California, it is still a relatively cool. Uh, cool climate that it brings with it and that chills the area down so if you, if you think about it California to you means desert it means hot uh, but it's that Pacific Ocean that is the main reason why uh, it is such a great wine region because it brings the cool area and it brings a little bit of fog in the morning um, that is imperative to cool down the grapes and extend uh, the, the ripening period and obviously retain acidity. Uh, I'll show this on the map in a bit as well, so you get a bit of a better idea. Uh, but basically, there are three kind of most important regions in California, even though there's, there's plenty and you should definitely discover all of California. But uh, obviously, Napa Valley being the main one, uh, Napa Valley is famous for their kind of Bordeaux wines, uh, mostly reds. You will get a lot of Cabernet, a lot of uh, Merlot as well, uh, and they do play around quite a bit with other varieties like uh, Petit Verdot and Cabernet Franc as well. Um, they do produce Chardonnay and they will call it Napa Valley, but it will generally come from a cooler region uh, called Carneros, which is in the south. And I'll show you this on the map as well, just again to give you an idea. The other main important region is just over the hills of Napa on the closer to the ocean, and this is Sonoma. So Sonoma is quite the opposite of of Napa, uh, and this is where Burgundy varieties uh, work best. So you got a lot of Pinot Noir and a lot of uh, super premium Chardonnay here as well. Uh, some absolutely spectacular wines. The other region that is definitely noteworthy is Lodi, uh, which is um, a little bit further east uh, of Napa. It's between Sacramento and uh, uh, San Jose in the south, um, and it is basically kind of a bulk production region. So all of that area is kind of like a desert and they are the main food growing uh, region for all of the US. <clears throat> but there is a tiny, tiny village or a tiny town called Lodi uh, where they produce some of the most outstanding Zinfandel grape um, in the world. Uh, and they're mostly famous for uh, having old vine Zinfandel, so vines that are over a hundred years old. Again, there are sandy soils there. So that can tell you, as we covered in the last section, we talked about uh, section, we talked about phylloxera, 
uh, phylloxera doesn't do well in sand. So there's a lot of vines that are uh, pre phylloxera vines that are still grafted on their own roots. <clears throat> that being said, a lot of people are now, when they are replanting, they are moving to grafted roots. And this is similar to Argentina, which we'll talk about later as well. All right, so that's California. The other main regions of the US, uh, you need to know about definitely Oregon. Oregon and its Willamette Valley, they're famous for their beautiful, beautiful Pinot Noirs. Um, there's also a bit of Syrah there and, and Chardonnay, but Pinot Noir is what, it's, uh, what it should be famous for, absolutely spectacular stuff. Um, Washington, just north of, of Oregon and its Columbia Valley, they make um, Syrah, they make Semillon, they make Riesling, they make loads of different grape varieties, but I would say Syrah and maybe Cabernet Sauvignon um, are kind of the two main ones. Uh, the last kind of bigger region is New York uh, and it's Finger Lakes, uh, which is a little bit more inland. It's next to lakes that look like a finger, look like a, like a hand, sort of. Um, and they're famous for white grape varieties, namely Riesling and a, and a kind of, a, let's say a local uh, grape variety called Vidal. It's not really local, but it's famous there. And the other one is Long Island, which is on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, just east of New York City. All right. So this map is quite interesting. Uh, if you look at it, there's plenty of little dots. And these dots are actually vineyards. So America is famous for actually producing wine in all 50 states. So Arkansas, uh, Wyoming, uh, you name it, they, they make it. Florida, they make wine. The most fun ones are definitely Alaska and Hawaii, where they also make wine, which is quite interesting. Now, don't get me wrong, these are not some amazing wines. Hawaii, for example, makes mainly wine for their pineapple sparkling uh, wine, which sounds great when you're on holiday there, but I doubt you would want to have something like that with your, uh, with your dinner if you're anywhere other than Hawaii. Um, but as you can see, the concentration uh, of the wineries is obviously in California and then uh, Oregon and Washington uh, up here uh, in the north. Okay, now I just want to go to to show you on the map uh, a little bit more about Sonoma and Napa because they are kind of the two most important ones uh, that you need to know about. Um, have a look at this website later, Discover California Wines. They have, uh, they're really serious about uh, people getting to know them. So they have a lot of really cool interactive maps and, and things like that. So have a look. Um, so this is one of them. So if we go out a little bit, so this is California, right? All over here. So as you can see, you can, you can grow grapes pretty much across uh, California, even in the South, in Los Angeles and San Diego, which is very, very hot, but they do produce some, some wines. Again, this is due to the Pacific Ocean that's here. But the main region we're gonna talk about today, uh, or are we, we are talking about today, um, are Napa Valley, which is this bit over here, and Sonoma, which is kind of everything here. So why is this important? So I don't know if you can see, but there's a little bit of like a, uh, there's a mountain range on this side and there's a mountain range on this side, and the valley is actually in between the Napa Valley. So what happens is that the cool air comes from here and it enters inside of this little corridor, uh, and it stops at the hills. And this produces this fog that I was talking about. And this fog sits basically uh, over the, the whole valley and it just kind of cools it down, brings the temperature down and it just kind of makes it uh, a very fresh uh, area, especially in the morning. So even during the day when it's very, very hot, uh, in the mornings, it tends to be nice and chilly and, and fresh. Now Sonoma is similar, but the fog enters through this canal over here. So the fog enters here and it moves down here and it moves up here. And again, it chills down the, the area quite a lot because this is shielded um, and uh, on both sides as well. The hot air during the day kind of gathers. So that provides the ripeness, but the, the chilly air that you get in the mornings. So as you can imagine, this is much closer to the, to the ocean as, it, as Napa is. So the, the fog is much cooler here. So even if the days are, are similar, the mornings are chillier in Sonoma. That's why they can produce um, the burgundy varieties I was talking about. In terms of style, there, there is a particular style that Americans do. Uh, and that's why when we talk about Chardonnay, 
we'll talk about either Burgundian style or we'll talk about kind of American style of Chardonnay. An American style of Chardonnay tends to be uh, richer, fuller, a little bit creamier, a little bit more oaky even, um, and similar, similar style actually applies to both um, their Pinot Noirs and their, and their Cabernets as well. So I always like to talk about uh, people when I talk about wine as well. So people will make wine that they, uh, that, that, that kind of works with their character, right? So for example, if you can imagine a French guy is not going to make a big, loud, um, jumpy, aromatic circus type uh, wine, right? And a French guy is going to make an elegant, very polished wine because he's elegant. He's very polished. He's kind of the guy that eats their, his snails and, and oysters and whatever. An American guy, he needs something to have with his burgers and his hot dogs. So obviously their wines are going to be uh, more approachable, uh, much more along the lines of um, kind of a, a broader, uh, broader styles of wine. The other things that I, want, I, want, I wanted to just briefly mention is Napa and Sonoma are very, very different in terms of culture as well. By culture, I mean how, what can you expect there if you go to visit? So whereas you go to Napa, it's all about these big wineries. It's almost like walking into Bordeaux or Champagne. So it's all about the, the prestige. It's all about the looks. It's all about kind of um, flaunting the wealth, right? Uh, whereas in Sonoma, it's a very different story. And Sonoma is much more like Burgundy in terms of culture as well. So instead of big chateaus and stuff like that, you've got tiny little uh, farms that people grow in, much, much smaller estates in general than, than you would find in Sonoma. So very different approach. Uh, when I was there, I really, really enjoyed uh, the way Sonoma looked and, and, and felt as well. People, people they're, they're nice everywhere, but in Napa, they just feel like a little bit more corporate, I guess. Whereas in Sonoma, people are very much uh, more open, I guess. Anyway, just to briefly show you, so Lola is here. So if you can have an imagine. So this, all of this blue part is pretty much a desert. Uh, and yeah, Loda, Loda is here. All right. So let's just briefly talk about some of the uh, iconic producers that come from the US. So one of the big ones is Chateau Montelena uh, and Stag's Leap. So like I said, these two were the wineries that actually won that 1976 um, uh, blind tasting. Now, for some reason, these are the only two wineries uh, from that uh, tasting that didn't actually go on to continually produce high-end wines, or, or let's say they didn't really capitalize on this, on this win. Other wineries uh, gained a lot more from it. Uh, America is also famous for uh, producing a lot of kind of boutique uh, wines, and one of the most famous one is the, the Screaming Eagle. Um, so basically what these are, these are like garage wines. There's, there's a guy had a garage, bought some wines from somebody and just made an absolutely outstanding wine. Uh, so Screaming Eagle is based on Cabernet. Um, and because everybody wanted to drink it, so as you know, Americans are all about marketing and things like that. Um, he didn't have enough wine. He kept on selling it out. So they introduced uh, a mailing list. And this is kind of transpired and a lot of Americans are using uh, this these days as well. So basically, it's like a mailing list where you need to apply to it uh, in order to get an allocation of wines. Uh, and for Screaming Eagle, basically, you need to wait 10 years before you even uh, get on the, on the short list uh, to be eligible to potentially get a wine one day. Um, Ridge, Ridge is the, so basically, the picture you see in the back uh, here, this is uh, from Ridge Vineyard. So Ridge Vineyard is an interesting one because it's probably the most iconic uh, wine estate that is not from Napa or Sonoma. Uh, it is actually um, on hills just on top of uh, Cupertino or San Jose. So Cupertino is famous for being Apple headquarters. Um, so they actually can see down, down to Apple's headquarters. But Ridge is quite spectacular. Probably my, my favorite winery for sure uh, from the Californias uh, because they are in these mountains. There was no electricity here. There was no water here. So they basically, when they, <laughs> there were a couple of hippies, really, like literal hippies that, that went up um, and, and built this estate from nothing. Um, 
and they make some serious, serious wines. Uh, the most famous one is the Montebello, which is the vineyard that's on the picture in the back. Um, you do have the region restaurant, right? Yes, you have the Litton Spring Zinfandel uh, Magnums. Um, from 96, I think we bought them, or 98? 98. 98. Um, we actually opened some for, for Christmas. We had a, we had a, a group that went for it. But yeah, they're famous for producing some amazing Zinfandel as well. Um, but yeah, Chardonnay is amazing. Their, their Montebello is outstanding. Some super serious stuff, basically, from Rich. Anyway, Opus One, very, very important winery as well. So remember Robert Bondavi, which I was talking about uh, as being the first guy to plant uh, or to build a new winery in the, um, in, Amer in the USA? So he actually um, went to the Rothschilds and they decided to build a winery together. Um, so Opus One is basically a, a winery on its own, but it is part owned by the Mondavi winery and um, by, the, uh, by the Rothschilds. And this is uh, kind of the best of both worlds. It's basically a French elegance put into an American style wine. So you get all of that robustness, all of that richness and fullness that you would get from an American. There's also quite a bit of polish uh, on their outstanding wine, probably one of the most famous ones these days because they've done a really good job at promoting it. We do have this in the, in the restaurants as well. Uh, <clears throat> and in terms of uh, Sonoma, Kistler definitely the most important guy in terms of Chardonnay. Um, people often say that if he was, that, that, that there's nobody that can emulate Burgundy uh, as closely as he did. Um, so in, and still kind of retain the American style. So Kistler, if you ever see a uh, beautiful Chardonnay, very, very expensive, but very, very uh, good and worth every penny. Okay, any questions on USA? All right, so let's move on to Argentina. So Argentina is kind of the, the second most important New World country, uh, although that can be argued by uh, plenty of other regions, but in my mind, Argentina is definitely important, and especially for our business, as it does play quite a quite an important role uh, in this. So, Argentina has similar to America; it has similarly long and short history at the same time. So, in terms of long history, um, they were growing grapes uh, in the 1500s. Um, so, the first grapes were, came over from Chile. Uh, and this was a great grape called uh, Criola Chica, uh, which was actually kind of the, the main grape variety for, I, th I think, 300, 400 years. Basically, until Malbec came along, Criola Chica was the main grape variety for Argentina. Mainly produced kind of not very interesting bulk wines, uh, house wines, uh, and so on. So to understand Argentina a little bit better, you need to understand the, the, the philosophy behind how it became to be. So. Um, it is built on immigrants, right? Um, mainly Spanish and Italian immigrants. There's, a, there's quite a few Germans as well there, but Spanish and the Italians kind of uh, came to the fore. And both Spanish and Italians have a strong culture of drinking wine socially. So it's a, it's a, it's a family uh, thing first. So obviously when they, when they came over with their boats, they brought in some cuttings from their own, um, from their own country. So you will find, for example, the Bonarda grape, uh, which is supposed to come from Italy, although I think they've proven now that it's not. Um, and you've, you've had quite a bit of Tempranillo in, in Argentina as well, which obviously the Spanish brought across. So, you know, they went to their own vineyard, they took some plantings to remind themselves of home uh, and they planted them in Argentina. Now, the main thing for Argentina uh, in terms of um, what we know about them today uh, happened in 1853, uh, namely on the 17th of April, the reason why we know this date and why it's kind of important is because this is also World Malbec Day. Um, so we had it not too long ago. Um, so basically there was this president, or I think he was actually governor of a province at the time, um, Domingo Faustino Sarmiento. And he basically asked uh, a guy to go to France and bring over some grape varieties. And among these French grape varieties, uh, one of the main ones that was brought over was Malbec. Um, so why did he do this? What was the point? So basically this president was like, nobody's really taking us seriously. We're Argentina, we're a beautiful, we're a large country. Uh, 
but nobody's taking us seriously for anything. So he revolutionized the whole agriculture by this. And he said, okay, guys, let's focus on one thing and let's do it right. Um, and this is what they did with Malbec. So they brought it over and they started cultivating it seriously. So um, you can imagine that the oldest Malbec vines can only be 150 year old uh, vines. And they are, there are actually some wineries that still have it. The other important bit for uh, the region of Mendoza, which became the most important region in terms of uh, winemaking, uh, was the railway, railway that was built from Buenos Aires. Now, I was in Argentina a year ago, exactly, actually, to the day. Uh, and I can tell you, this railway is an absolute shithole. Uh, I think there's a, there's, the trains are very unreliable and very rare. Uh, however, in 1885, uh, this was obviously the, the culmination of technology at the time. And what it, what it uh, did was, because Buenos Aires to Mendoza is almost 1,000 kilometers, I think, if not even more. So people didn't really travel that far. But with the railway, this allowed the, the wines to be uh, brought into Buenos Aires. So it kind of started to develop this culture of their restaurants drinking wine from a particular region, which was in this case Mendoza. So it just kind of kick-started um, the commercial aspect of winemaking in Argentina. So Argentina was famous for mainly just drinking all of their wines. They were, I think they were quoted for drinking 90 liters of wine per person a year, which is massive. Uh, just do the math how much that is uh, per person, and that is in, per capita. So that's including children. Right, so insane. So they were producing these bulk wines. Uh, to give you an example, they're, they're a hectare of, um, of vines in, in Argentina at that time produced 40 tons of grapes, one hectare. In France, the same hectare produced about six, seven, eight hectares of wines. So Argentina was producing four times, five times, six times more um, quantity in the same sort of space. So you can imagine, like I said, grapes don't like to be spoiled. Gra grapes don't like to be vigorous. They like to be uh, carefully managed. They want to be deprived of, of good things to actually showcase their true character. Now, this is where a very important lady comes in, uh, Laura Catania. So Laura Catania comes from the Catania family. They were Italian immigrants uh, and they've been making wine for a very long time. And her father, Nicolas, is, is now credited to be the, the kind of the father of premium uh, wine trade in terms of Argentina. So in 1994, Lara was uh, a young girl at the time. Um, <clears throat> she went with his dad to this exhibition in New York where they, he was kind of showcasing his wines uh, or Argentinian wines for that matter. And she was looking around and she saw all of the other tables from all other parts of the world being crowded with people and nobody came to their table. And she was so pissed off that she decided, okay, we're gonna change this. Um, so basically what they did is they found a vineyard uh, in Uco Valley, uh, which is in the Southern part of Mendoza uh, called Adriana Vineyard, named after her sister. <coughs> and they found this to be one of the most spectacular vineyards in Argentina. And they started to experiment with it and they started producing some serious uh, single plot, so single vineyard and single plot wines, which kind of brought them uh, some prestige. Um, and yeah, since then, the, the, the trajectory of Argentinian wines just went up. So before that, nobody really took them seriously. But at that point, it all kind of changed. And it's all to do with Laura, really. So Laura, who she is, um, so obviously she's the head of Catania Winery uh, these days, but she is also a proper doctor, like an uh, um, in medicine. She's a practicing doctor in San Francisco. She wrote books. Uh, she travels all the time. Uh, if you if you meet her, I mean, this, she's a serious lady. We had a, a, a dinner with her at uh, Threadneedle Street last year, and she was just uh, spectacular. She had us eating out of her hands. Anyway, but just to give you an idea of how, um, how difficult a journey it has been for um, Argentina, have you guys ever heard of the point system, the 100 points, the Parker points, anything like that? Maybe not. Um, so there's this guy called Robert Parker Jr. And he wrote for uh, the Wine Advocate, which is one of the wine publications. 
and he was struggling to get people to understand uh, kind of the quality of wines, of, or, or not struggling, but he was trying to figure out how to bring wine closer to the people or how he should um, tell people what to drink. So he developed this point system. Uh, so it was a point system up to 100 points, uh, which basically meant if your wine got 100 points, uh, it is um, a bucket list wine. Basically, it is one wine that you should, you should if you're serious about wine, this is what you should try. Um, in reality, basically anything above 95 is a world-class wine. Uh, 90 to 95 is a very, very good wine. And then kind of below that, I don't think a lot of people actually publish their scores if they're under 85. Let's put it like that. Anyway, but this became kind of the steeple. So everybody started using this system and everybody started putting these points on their, on their bottles uh, to showcase um, how good their wines was. Just to give you an example, so for example, the Italian Sassicaia was the first Italian wine to get 100 points. Um, so this is the, the crowd that gets 100 points. So it's just the top, top, top wines of the world. So I was talking about Argentinian premium wines. And the first 100 point wines were only awarded to Argentina in 2018. So two years ago was the first time they finally got their 100 points. Uh, and this was uh, for two wines by Alejandro Vigil, which is actually the winemaker at Catena, again. Um, so one of their wines, uh, which is the Catena uh, Adriana Vineyard, Riverstone Malbec got 100 points, and Alejandro's separate project, uh, the Gran Enemigo, which is actually not a Malbec, it is a Cabernet Franc, uh, which also got 100 points. So this kind of, when this happened, this finally cemented Argentina in the world of serious winemaking and they and it, and it seriously removed the, the thinking of it just being about uh, bulk wine region. Okay, so in terms of regions, so Argentina is massive um, and the main kind of, I've been talking about Mendoza a lot. So Mendoza is basically this region over here and even Mendoza is kind of divided um, into, into a few other villages. So unlike when we're talking about Bordeaux and Burgundy and when we're talking about Appalachians, they don't really have a similar system in Mendoza, but they've started to work on it. So they've, a lot of the winemakers are starting to um, put the names of vineyards on their, on their wines. They're putting the, the names of the villages on their wines just to give people a little bit of a better understanding of, of um, where the wines come from. The two kind of most recognized regions at the moment are uh, Uco Valley, which is all the way down here. Um, in the south, and it's famous for having very, very high altitude vineyards. And the other one is uh, Luan de Cujo, which is kind of next, just a little bit south of Mendoza City, about 10 minutes away. Um, and this is in Luan, you get a lot of these uh, wineries. So even if they will have vineyards more towards the Andes, more towards the mountains, um, they will have wineries down here. Now, the other important regions that you kind of need to know about are uh, Salta in the north, and then uh, in Patagonia in the south. So Mendoza is a fairly straightforward region in terms of climate. It, is, it sits between uh, the, the right parallels that we talked about. Um, so it has a moderate climate, kind of dry and hot, uh, but it's uh, far, far, uh, the altitude is high enough. So I think the, the lowest point in Mendoza is a, a thousand meters of, of altitude. Um, so you still get that freshness because of the diurnal range. So diurnal range is something we haven't really talked about uh, before, but what diurnal range basically means is the difference between the day and night temperature. So uh, if you think about Bordeaux, Bordeaux during the day will be 22 degrees, at night, it will be 19 degrees, right? So not a big difference. In Argentina, it's very different. So for example, in Mendoza, during the day, you will have um, 38 degrees in the summer, in their summer, um, and you will have 12, 13 degrees uh, at night. So a big, big difference. So why is this important in terms of wine? It is, it is to do with, again, with the ripening period. So in Bordeaux, because it's kind of always the same, the grapes will just kind of move slowly all the time. So they won't stop, but they will never really uh, work incredibly hard. In Argentina, it's the opposite. So for example, during the day, the grapes will work really, really hard. They will sprint uh, uh, 
to get to kind of the ripeness level. And then at night, because it's so cold, they will kind of just cuddle up and they will, they will stop doing anything. So what's the name of this? Diurnal range. So D-I-U-R-N-A-L, -L, diurnal. Um, I don't think I've written it anyway. Um, anyway, so this is what benefits um, Mendoza. Salta is a little bit more interesting because who can tell me what are the two, uh, the two parallels of lo lo longitude that we, can, that we can grow grapes in? Marco, do you remember? Uh, sorry. What? 30 and 50. Yeah, between 30 and 50. So Salta actually sits around 24. Uh, so a lot further north, closer to the equator that you should be allowed to grow grapes in. But what Salta has uh, very important is it has the, the altitude again. So while during the day it can be even over 40 degrees, at night it can get close to zero, even in the summer, uh, because this is very, very high up in the mountains. So most of the vineyards are concentrated above 1500 meters, but you have vineyards such as the Colomé stuff that is up to 3000 meters of altitude. To give you an example, in Europe, there is no vineyard above 900, I think, or what, 1,000 for sure, but I think nothing over 900 meters either. Um, so very, very high altitude. And again, this massive diurnal range that you get, okay? So Salta, very interesting. What this gives you is um, a little bit more polish. I find the wines from Salta tend to be a little bit more elegant um, because they have much more of this acidity, much more of this freshness. Um, on the other side, you've got uh, Patagonia, and Patagonia is freezing, right? It is very, very, very cold here. Uh, but what they have is, and Patagonia used to be famous, uh, used to be famous for their fruit making. So Rio Negro that you see here in Nequen, uh, they are both famous for a lot of their fruit. But in the recent years, they've started to produce a lot of uh, wine there as well. Now, what they have is because they're so far south, they actually have uh, super long days, right? Because as you imagine, this is, this is basically Sweden for us. So why can't we grow grapes in Sweden? And why can we grow them here? Again, the, the answer lies in the, in the, what did I say? Coriolis effect, right? Remember? So Coriolis effect is the thing that moves the, the oceans around. So in Sweden, there is no warm water anywhere. There's freezing water. There's the Baltic, there's the, the Northern Sea that absolutely uh, batters, uh, batters the coast. But in here, you get the, kind of the warmest bit of the ocean uh, uh, coming, coming down here. Uh, so that kind of warms up the area. So even though it's kind of on a similar range than, than what the Nordic countries would be, that warm, uh, warm sea just kind of warms up everything. And with these longer days, because as you know, same as in Sweden uh, or, or Norway or whatever, uh, they have longer days during the summer. Uh, same thing happens here. So they just, they are able to grow grapes, even though they're not in ideal conditions. Okay. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned, and it's very, very important in Argentina, is because, like I said, it's dry, very, very dry over there. So they have to irrigate quite a lot. Uh, and this, so because they've always been irrigating, this is what, what made them produce so much volume, so much wine. Uh, and the way they irrigated was they basically tried to collect the water from the Andes. And one of the, one of the examples is the picture I have here in the back. And this is a, an, an artificial lake. It's called the Potrerios. Um, and it's basically, they, they built a dam and they, they kind of protect uh, they keep the water in that melts uh, after the summer that comes from the glaciers, from the, from the Andes, uh, and then they kind of distribute it to their vineyards. So they can actually dry out. This is a massive lake, absolutely massive. I was there, I can tell you, it is huge. Um, but it can still be emptied out. They have problems with it um, sometimes when they kind of uh, run out of water by the end of, by the, end of the vintage. Um, so yeah, very important to know they do irrigate and they, they irrigate quite a lot. <clears throat> now the other thing that's important because of this dryness and allowing uh, irrigation is because it's so dry, 
Argentina isn't affected by vintage as much as, as Europe, for example. So because it's dry, there's no rot, um, there's no fungi, there's no problems like that. Um, and because they can irrigate as they wish, they give the wines exactly what they need. Um, so this brings a very, very constant quality throughout the vintages. Um, so remember when I talked about Burgundy and Bordeaux, so they can't irrigate there, which means that um, they are very reliant on what the vintage will give them. And in turn, that means the vintages will be very, very different. In Argentina, you're pretty much safe, uh, whether you buy 17, 18, 16, 15. Um, the only exceptions will be the years of El Nino. Um, if you know about El Nino, is that phenomenon that brings in um, uh, bad weather to the South America, <clears throat> where it's just either too watery um, to produce proper wines or not. All right. Okay, briefly touching on the icons. So Catania, obviously, as I mentioned, they are the main reason that people are taking uh, Argentina seriously these days. Um, spectacular winery, really. They, their winery is shaped like a pyramid, absolutely beautiful there as well. And I'm proud to say that they're one of their main winemakers, apart from Alejandro Vigil, is also a Slovenian by native. So again, a shout out for me. <laughs> um, the other one that's quite important is Colome. So I mentioned the briefing, so they're famous for their Salta uh, winery and their highest altitude vineyard. So they have 3000 meters up um, in, the, in the mountains that their vineyards are, are planted, some of them. Uh, Vina Cobo is very famous as well. Um, this was actually, it's an American guy, uh, Paul Hobbs, uh, that produces this wine and it just kind of be, just makes outstanding high quality wines all the way down in, in, the, in the Uco Valley as well. Um, Susana Balbo, probably one of the most famous female winemakers of Argentina. <coughs> and Luigi Bosca, which I'm sure you've heard of before, um, which I can't remember the name of the winery, uh, sorry, of the family, Arizu. It's uh, the Arizu family that owns it now, um, and they have this uh, Econo Malbec, Malbec uh, which is pretty spectacular as well. Um, last one I want to just briefly touch on is Terrazas de los Andes. So, we talked about Opus One being a collaboration between two to um, two very important wineries, one in Bordeaux, one in America. But Terrazas de los Andes is an Argentinian winery that is owned by um, LVMH, so we return my Hennessy again. And they've actually, um, they are the, the um, what are they called? They also own a winery called uh, Cheval Blanc, which we talked about in Bordeaux, the Santa Emilian winery. So they decided they're going to do a collaboration between Terraza de los Andes and Cheval. So they built a vineyard, uh, which is now called Cheval de Andes. So a combination of both the words. And basically what they want to achieve is they want to produce uh, the best possible Argentine wine, again, with French expertise. So if you ever see Cheval de Andes or Cheval de Andes um, in French, uh, it is one of the most spectacular wines as well. Mostly reliant on Malbec and Cabernet Sauvignon. <clears throat> but you will find quite a bit of, of Cabernet Franc there, a bit of Petit Verdot, Carmen Air, um, as well. All right. Oh, and last one is Bodega Chakra. Um, Bodega Chakra is in Patagonia, and they're famous for making the best Pinot Noir in Argentina. So in terms of grapes, so Argentina is obviously famous for their Malbec, but Cabernet Franc is making a huge, huge deal uh, these days. So remember when we talked about Cabernet Franc, in terms of France, and it had these, these pyrazines, this very vegetal, very green aroma. So this is the trick. In Argentina, it doesn't. Because Argentina has a slightly longer uh, growing period, it tends to develop better, and it just kind of takes that away, uh, that greenness of the flavor. So you're left with this beautiful, very blue fruity uh, flavors, blueberries and plums and flavors that are absolutely delicious. So uh, Cabernet Franc from Argentina is definitely one of my favorite grape varieties. Um, you will also find quite a bit of Petit Verdot, similar to uh, France. In France, it doesn't really ripen fully. Here it does. Um, you have beautiful white grape varieties here. Torontes is a, uh, oh, sorry, Torontes um, is a local grape variety, uh, mainly grown in Salta and in Patagonia. Cooler climates, of course. It's a very fresh grape variety. 
<clears throat> you will find a lot of Chardonnay here as well. Uh, what else? One of the most interesting stories that I heard was uh, there's this winery called Bodega Norton. They're also in Luhan. <clears throat> and they actually grow Gruner Weltliner. If you've not heard of this, this is an Austrian grape variety. So the owners of Norton Winery are the Austrians. They are the owners of Swarovski, the Christos. So they're very proud Austrians, of course, uh, in spite of some of them. I think the son has lived in Argentina for 30 years now, and he's in charge of the winery. Uh, so they, <laughs> they, they smuggled over a cutting of Gruner Weltliner, and they actually grow a really beautiful Gruner uh, in Oco Valley in Argentina as well. So there's a lot of interesting grape varieties um, there. I talked about Tempranillo as well. There's Bonarda, there's Criolla, there's, there's loads of grapes. Um, but yeah, kind of Malbec is still the main one for that. All right, that's it from me for today. Uh, you've got some links here, Discover California Wines. It's California Wine Institute. They have really spectacular website, a lot of information, a lot of maps, a lot of um, sheets and facts they can tell you you can if you're curious how much of so California produces 90% of of uh, American wine exports 90% it's insane um, so you've got all of little facts like that how many plantings there are when was this done when was that done and so on so a lot of information um, wines of Argentina um, obviously very very important um, source of information for Argentinian wines and obviously my website so you can look at this movie uh, this video of today it will be up in about three hours let's say so if you want to go back I know it's again a lot of information um, but yeah if you need to go back you can you can look at it then all right so any questions about today guys no all right so no. that's it thank you very much as usual thank you sir my pleasure. Uh, Lena, quick Thank one, you. one Yeah. But um, we noticed that most of the um, American famous wine or grapes or area is the Pacific one. Is there is a reason why the Pacific one is well better known than the Atlantic one? Yes. Again, coming back to that Coriolis effect. So if you think about Coriolis effect, so whereas with the Pacific, so California is hot. So the Pacific comes from the north and it kind of still brings relatively cool air, uh, cool air down, right? Whereas uh, on the other side, the Atlantic, when it comes to Miami, when it comes to Bahamas, it's the hottest it will ever be, right? So that's why you can't really grow high quality grapes in, in Florida because that's, the ocean is gonna be the hottest there. So it brings the hot climate now. Right? There's no chilling, there's no moderating factor there. So it only comes into effect when you go to the north and we get to like Long Island, where Long Island should be very, very cold, but because the ocean is still relatively warm there, relatively I'm saying, uh, and the, the winds are relatively warm, it, it allows it to, to progress. So it's, that's why Coriolis effect, very, very important. If you didn't remember it from one of the first sessions we talked about, go back to it, study it, and it will explain all of this. Right. Same reason why you can't grow uh, grapes on the north, on the eastern coast of Brazil, but you can in Patagonia. Exactly the same thing. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. There's a few questions here. Is no. All right. Anybody else? Nope. All right. Thank you very much, guys, and I will see you on Thursday. See you Thursday. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.